Guys, this is Mobeen. We are talking about the cardiovascular system physiology. The lecture today is about the ECG or EKG. What are we going to do today is why do we measure the ECG? What is the heart's conduction medium? Why can we measure it? I mean, what happens? How can we pull the electrical activity out and put it in a piece of paper? What is that conduction medium that allows this to happen? Then measuring from the body surfaces, what does it mean to measure the cardiac output from the sorry cardiac action potentials or electrical activity from the surface of the body? We will also talk about the voltmeter, the quality of the voltmeter that actually measures the electrical currents. We will talk about the ECG paper, normal ECGs electrical activity we will talk about that and then 12 lead ECGs, various leads and interpretation of the, those leads and what do they show us and axis determination, how do we know the cardiac axis and if the heart has become uh, rotated, then arrhythmias or the pathologies that can be seen through the, uh, through the ECG. So, let us start. First of all, let me show you a diagram from the old times. So, here is an early EKG machine. If you see here, this is this big hunking machine is the, the ancient ECG machine and the person who is sitting there as you can see, he has his uh, arms and his left leg in the conducting solution and those then uh, solutions will be conducting the electrical activity to the ECG machine itself and that is what will pick up ECG and, and um, do the uh, you know show the ECG itself. Also notice that this ECG will be here is a paper roll and that paper roll would be rotating and that is on and on that paper roll there is the ECG that is being formed. So, very very interesting that from there we have come that now you can do ECG with your iPhone. Okay, so, now let us see here, let us say this is the heart in our chest for from electrical point of view first thing master this understand this make it strong in your head that the atria are separated from the ventricle through the annulus fibrous, this ring. It is a fibrous ring that insulates the atria from the ventricles. What that, what does that mean? What is the outcome? What am I trying to convey here? Atrial electrical activity should not spill into the ventricular electrical activity and ventricular electrical activity should not spill into the atrial electrical activity. So, then you say well, but we do want the activity electrical activity to go from atria to ventricle yes and for that we have AV node, AV bundle, his Purkinje system that is a specialized system that brings and it is a one way system we have done it in the past. It brings the electrical activity from the atria towards the ventricle and does not let it go back. In pathological conditions there may be short circuiting of the ventricular muscle to the atrial muscle and there might be re-entry that would happen and that can cause arrhythmias and that can cause problems. So, first remember this is important annulus fibrous has a huge, huge role in normal electrical activity of the heart. The conduction system very quickly SA node is the normal pacemaker of the heart. From the SA node the electrical activity spreads to the atria itself, atria are weak and thin muscles compared to ventricle especially the left ventricle due to which atrial electrical activity shows lower or smaller amplitude or less strong in the ECG compared to the ventricles. Once the atrial activity electrical activity reaches the AV node over there at the AV node there is a delay that delay is important so that atria can pump the blood in the ventricle and then the ventricle squeeze. We do not want them both to squeeze at the same time. We want atria to squeeze, push the blood into the ventricle, then ventricle to squeeze. So, that delay occurs at the AV node and AV bundle. Then as we reach the ventricles, you know that there is the bundle left bundle branch and the right bundle branch. Those branches then go into the myocytes. There is a modified myocyte called Purkinje fiber. Purkinje fiber is actually the last parts of the conducting system of the heart and that is where the conduction system connects with the myocyte and these are Purkinje fibers. These little branches here are the Purkinje fibers and they are sunk into the myocardium and then they become muscles. So, they are called modified muscles and embryologically I have done that in the embryo lectures. And finally, there is the ventricle muscle. 
one more point to keep in mind for, for the activity. Atria, both of them contract as a unit, as a syncytium. Ventricles, both of them and all the ventricular muscles contract as a unit, as a syncytium. So when the electrical impulse comes to the ventricle, you can assume that the whole ventricular muscle cluster, all the millions of muscle fibers will contract together. So that is a unit activity. So left bundle branch, right bundle branch and that is the heart and its conduction system. Now when the electrical activity is happening in the heart, heart is sitting here in the chest. If you put an electrical probe right on the heart, you can actually pick up the electrical potential that is occurring in the heart. So the question is how can you pick it up? Imagine, imagine like a Robocop. Remember in the Robocop there is that lungs and the heart and the brain and that's all it has. Imagine that thing is immersed in a fluid tank. Imagine our heart is immersed, we are filled with fluid. Heart is immersed in that fluid. So when the electromagnetic waves occur in the heart, they propagate out in the body as well. So of course right over the heart, they will be stronger. As we keep moving on the sides, they will start becoming weaker and as we reach the ends of the limbs, they become even more weak. So that is one thing. Even lungs, which are actually very thin tissue with, filled with, with air, even lungs are pretty good conductors. So please remember our fluid, it is not water. Water is not a good conductor, but we have electrolytes in the water. We have sodiums and potassiums and calciums and negative proteins and so many things that all make this system a conducting system. So imagine, close your eyes and imagine that heart is immersed in a fluid tank that is a conducting fluid. That means if you put probes on the outside of the tank, you will be able to pick up electromagnetic waves of the heart. That's one. Second thing. If you are picking up the electromagnetic waves on the heart, right on the heart, the, the ventricular depolarization can actually be measured as 110 millivolts. Please write it down somewhere. 110 millivolts can be felt right above the heart. As you start moving near the remote parts of the trunk, the electrical activity, the, the strength of the electrical current reduces to 3 or 4 millivolts, from 110 millivolts to 3 or 4 millivolts. And as you go to the limbs, it goes down to 1.5 or 1 millivolt. That is how much the difference is. Now normally the limb leads that we use, they are attached to the limbs and then chest leads are attached to the chest. The lead that we will talk about today, the lead that we will use today is going to be this lead number 2. Chest leads is a separate lecture but here it is important to call this out. Lead number 2 has the negative end attached to the right arm and positive end attached to the left leg. So because heart is oriented this way and most of the heart's current moves like this, this lead is the best lead to see the proper potentials in the heart. The left side is here and the right side is here. It is almost the same axis as the electrical current and because of that the current is maximally seen in the lead to in a normal heart. If the heart is moved and, and, and shaked, then that is a different situation. Okay, so now let us talk about this that what is the principle of picking up the electrical activity. So look, here is a voltmeter. A voltmeter, imagine this for a second, that you have, you have a, uh, you have two glasses in your hand and those two glasses are, I don't know if you can see this, let's say this is one glass and this is the other glass. They both have some fluid in them. And let's say if you put a tube in both of them like this. Now, if you raise one glass, so let's say this is the glass A and this is glass B. If you raise the glass A, then the fluid from the glass A are going to move towards the glass B. And if you raise the glass A here, then the fluid from, sorry, I said it the other way. If you raise the glass A, then the fluid from glass A will move to glass B. But if you keep them on a same level, then there is no fluid movement. 
that is the same rule for the voltage meter. The voltmeter will only will only it has two probes, it has a positive and a negative end. It registers when one of the probe is on a different potential than the other one. For example, if the both are positive, if you take these probes and attach them to some place which both places are positive, this is going to register nothing. If the both are negative, it is going to register nothing. But if one side is positive and one negative, then there is a circuit and you it would show the deflection. The question is, this is important, what is the question? The question is, if positive end is connected to positive and negative end is connected to negative, what kind of deflection you will see? You will see a deflection towards the positive. I am going to repeat this one part. If positive end is connected to the probe that is showing a positive, a negative is end is connected to a probe that is showing negative, then the meter would show a positive side deflection. If you reverse it, if you attach the positive end, for example, in this example here, if you attach the positive end to the negative side, a negative end to the positive, then the meter would show the opposite deflection. But if both are positive or both are negative, then it shows no deflection. That is a principle of the volt meter. Outcome, what do you remember out of this? Volt meter will only only check what is the only volt meter would only assess a change in the current, but not the similarity of the current, even if it is polarized or depolarized. That is important. So, now in the heart, how does the volt meter help us? Imagine that you take a volt meter and you put a probe here and a probe here on a cardiac muscle fiber and you see the electrical activity. Look, normally the cardiac conduction system or the muscle is polarized. Polarized mean inside of the cell is negative, that is the resting potential negative, right? Minus 90, minus 84, minus 94 millivolts. Inside is negative, of course that means outside is positive. The positive ions are attracted to the outside of the membrane. If you put the, so this is a resting heart cell. If you put the probes on it, what are the probes seeing? Both probes are experiencing positive outside and that is about it. Or if they are inside the cell, then they both are experiencing negative activity inside and that is it. So, let us just use the probe on the outside. So, when they are outside, they are both experiencing positive. If they both are experiencing positive, that means the meter is going to show no deflection. Now, let us say the electrical activity started. Let us say the essay node said, okay, go electrical potential came. When that came, this red here is the spread of the potential. So, let us say the potential is going to spread from point A towards point B. When it goes from there, what happens? The cell becomes depolarized. Depolarized means what? That the negative is going to move out and positive is going to move in or basically positive moves in, right? Sodium bursts comes in. So, the all of the cell is not or all tissue cells are not yet depolarized. If they, these were 100 cells, then initial 10 or 15 cells have become depolarized, next cells have not. So, now the probe is showing a different story. The positive end is still showing positive, that is a polarized cell and the this end, the A end has been sitting on the cells that have become depolarized. The wave of depolarization is going this way. So, now the voltmeter shows a positive deflection. Imagine this for a second, please come here. Imagine if this voltmeter with this needle is attached on a paper where the paper is moving on a regular interval, whatever, somebody is pulling the paper lightly. And when the, and this voltmeter needle has an ink here, ink spot here. So, when the positive deflection would occur, the needle would go up and it would go up that would cause a positive wave to form and when the, there is negative activity it sees, then it is going to go down. When it would go down, that would cause a negative wave to form and as the paper is being pulled, when it goes down, the wave is going to look like this and then when it comes back to 0, the wave is going to become completed. 
if you did not move the paper, if the paper was constant or static, it was not moving, then the needle would just go down and back up. It would go down and back up or it would go up and back down. This would just be a line. But because the paper is moving, it would show things like this. Okay, so here when the wave of depolarization is moving from cell to cell to cell, so imagine these are thousand cells, then we see this positive deflection. Then what happens is all of the tissue becomes fully depolarized. That means all, posit all cells have positives gone in. This whole red thing, the whole thing has become depolarized. Once again, the probes are now sitting on the same charges, although the charges are negative outside now, but still they are the same, so no deflection. Then if you come down here, repolarization, now keep this in mind please, repolarization will start from where the depolarization started. Why? Look, if this cell became depolarized, if this cell became depolarized now, and this is the cell number 1, and this is cell number 10, that became depolarized at the end, which cell will be repolarizing first? Of course, the one that became depolarized earlier. After the depolarization, it is restoring its, its ions, right? while the cell number 10 is still undergoing the depolarization. So what happens is, what you need to know is, the wave of depolarization goes from point A to B, then wave of repolarization goes from point A to B as well. However, if you see here, when the repolarization is happening, now point A has become repolarized or the cells here, 100 cells, 2000 cells, whatever, and point B is still not, is still depolarized, let us say another 1000, 2000 cells, the result of that is that the meter is going to show a negative deflection. Why a negative? Because here the positive end is sitting on negative or it has become the reversed. So when it shows negative, if you take this meter and rotate it and attach it to the paper, you will see negative would go downwards and positive will go up. So that is the basic principle. Now if you apply this principle, if you take a voltmeter and apply it here and here, right arm and left leg, and let the heart do the electrical activity, then we can see the electrical activity and pick it up when change happens. So keep in mind, when heart is completely polarized, no change. When it is completely depolarized, no change. That means contracted, no change. When it is contracting, when the message came to start contraction, then you will see a change. When it is relaxing, when the message repolarization was occurring, then it would show a uh, deflection. That is what we are interested in as doctors, what is happening in, during the action potentials. Okay. So come here now. Let us look at the paper. ECG paper, I am going to show you a diagram here for the ECG paper as well. So look at this, this is a normal ECG and this is the normal ECG paper. So what is important to see here is, can you see that there are big boxes, square boxes and then each square box here is further divided into smaller boxes. So we have big boxes and smaller boxes. And we have vertical lines and we have horizontal lines. So check that out here. So there are big boxes and then the, within the big boxes there are smaller boxes. This paper is attached to a roll which has a motor attached to it and the paper is moving at the speed of 25 millimeter of the paper per second. That is important, that is the key here. 25 millimeter of paper per second is moving. So that means if one big box, and I am throwing out a number, let us say one big box is 5 millimeter. How many millimeters in a second? 25. How many 5 millime millimeters in 25 millimeter? 5. So that means about 5 boxes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 boxes will move in 1 second. So keep this in mind, we will use it, we will use this information. Now within each box, so let us first dispense the discussion of the box, the square. 
on the horizontal side the square measures the time because it is the movement of the paper and that time measurement is that we have one square equal to 0 0.2 seconds why 0 0.2 200 millisecond look we said five boxes five one two three four five five boxes or I'll, I'll do them here one two three four five five boxes make up one second so divide one second in five pieces 20 20 20 20 20 makes a hundred right that is why 0 0.2 second or 200 milliseconds is one big box now that one big box is further divided into five smaller boxes so 0 0.2 second or 200 millisecond divided further five times that means 40 millisecond per small box this small box here this small box here the size is 40 milliseconds or 0 0.04 second that is the smallest unit guys if you can remember this that one on horizontal side on horizontal time duration smallest box is 0 0.04 second or 40 millisecond from there you can calculate everything on the vertical side vertical side is the amplitude remember the vertical side is the voltage meter and as the volt change the meter is going to deflect on the vertical line because it is the volt meter that is deflecting the vertical lines are responsible to show amplitude of the voltage the current's amplitude is shown by vertical lines so current on the vertical side time on the horizontal side current on the y-axis time on the x-axis now what current that is actually easier one box one large box shows so this is one large box I have brought it out here one large box shows five millimeter size and it is 0 0.5 millivolts that means two large boxes will make one millivolt QRS complex is normally one 1 1.5 millivolts so two or three large boxes one large box half millivolt and it has five divisions so what is what do you think each division is going to be one millivolt right so one division one small division vertically vertically this way show is one millimeter in size in the length or height and it shows one millivolt of voltage so that is what is the paper um, papers measurements now what do you think how many boxes in in one minute so think about it don't don't try to memorize it I said there will be the paper speed is 25 millimeter per second just remember this paper speed is 25 millimeter per second that means five boxes in one second so then in 60 second 5 multiplied by 60 300 boxes so 300 boxes pass through this machine in one minute so if you go through all 300 boxes and you measure all the QRS complexes there then you have all the, you have the heart rate but normally it is difficult to go through all the 300 boxes and you normally do not do the one minute long ECG strips just to get the heart rate there are other ways so now we're going to talk about how to measure the heart rate from the ECG paper and we'll do a quick example as well in this ECG what we are seeing is look at these two QRS complexes this is lead one this one is lead one here this QRS complex is somewhere almost at the start of a box so we are big box so we are lucky and then it is finishing exactly on a big box so if I just measure the big boxes between them I can actually calculate the heart rate here so how many big boxes between the two QRS complexes one big box two big boxes three four five six big boxes six big boxes are for one cardiac cycle so if that is the case how do we 
how do we understand it? What you do is how many big boxes in one minute? 300. Divide that by the number of big boxes for one cardiac cycle 6 and that would give you the heart rate. So what is 300 by 6 divided by 6? 50. So this patient's heart rate, this patient's heart rate is 50 beats per minute. That is one way of doing it. Divide the big boxes by the 300. And big boxes, which big boxes? The one from one QRS complex to the next. And what is the general formula? Very quick formula. Look, if there is one QRS complex per big box, that one QRS complex means one beat. If every big box shows one QRS complex in it, then how many big boxes in one minute? 300. How, how many beats? 300. If you see one QRS complex in two big boxes, that is two big boxes contain one complex. So maybe one complex is here, the other complex is in here, then other complex is in here. So in this case, what is happening is that heart rate is divided by half. So if you see two, one QRS complex in every two big boxes, then it is 150. So here is a quick method. QRS complex in every box, 300. QRS complex in every two boxes, heart rate 150. One QRS complex in every three boxes, heart rate 100. One QRS complex in every four boxes, heart rate 75. So what is the formula? The formula is take the number, the QRS complexes in the big boxes and divide that with 300. So 300 but number divided by number of big boxes that have the QRS complexes in it. That is one way. There is another way and that is that you look at the QRS complexes in 6 second. So if you go back here, 6 second, how many, how many big boxes in 1 second? So if we go back here, 1 second has 5 big boxes. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this is 1 second measure 6 such seconds and see how many QRS complexes in that. You have to have a long strip for that, normally you do not. But if you have a strip where you can measure the QRS complexes in 6 second, 6 second would mean 30 QRS big boxes, then multiply the number by 10, why? Because there are 10 6 seconds in a minute and that would also give you the number of uh, heartbeats. And the most accurate one, the most lovely one, let us use this one, 1500 divided by the number of small boxes. Small boxes, we are not talking big boxes now. What does that mean? Calculate the number of small boxes, can you see this? Calculate the number of small boxes from one QRS complex to the other, not calculate, actually count count them and then 1500 divided by that count also gives you the heart rate. So let us see that here in one of our examples. Let us use that here. This example, how many small boxes? It is actually easy for me to do that. The, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 big boxes. So 6 big boxes, every big box has 5 divisions. So how many divisions then? 6 multiplied by 5 is 30 divisions, right? So now you take 1500 and divide that with 30 small divisions. So what would that mean? 50. So 50 beats per minute. This is the most accurate method and this also is very useful, but it needs you to look at and count the small units and sometimes it is not easy. So you just start from here and then you keep becoming precise as you need to. So that is the determination of the heart rate from the ECG paper.